uh, I'm sorry, the million dollar biology Bitcoin bet that this is the end of days. I, I think it's not the end of days, but I, I think you're conflating a bunch of things together. So look, MMT. Yes, I am. Yes. Was in hindsight idiotic. In the moment, it never quite made sense, but in hindsight, it's clearly idiotic. And I think that we can properly dispense with that. But the reason that we print so much money is sort of what Freebrook says, which is that we just want a well functioning society. And the simplest and shortest way to do that is to make sure that there aren't any winners and losers anymore. And the most effective way to do that in the markets is with money. Print a bunch of money and there are no more winners and losers. And so everybody can kind of win. Some people may, may win more, but nobody really ever loses. So I think that's the, that's the MO that we're operating under. The thing is, there's I don't something think that, unhealthy to that, Chamath. You're sort of alluding yeah, to but no losers. That's a more philosophical and a commentary on capitalism and a bunch of other things. And you're right. I don't think it makes sense. I do think you need winners and losers to really make society function well. But the other part of it is like, does it reinforce or does it decay US dollar hegemony? And I think it actually reinforces it. And the reason is just very practically speaking. When you look at how dependent other people, other countries are on the US dollar in times of stress, they actually become more dependent. And that has a lot to do with their borrowing patterns, the amount of dollars central banks need outside the United States. And so what did you see in a moment of stress? Actually, the Fed opened up swap lines to all the central banks that they work with uh, their most important operating partners. So Europe, Canada, Japan, etc, Switzerland, and they moved the liquidity window from weekly to daily, and they pounded the swap lines. So I don't know, I think that most people that that kind of like, it's like a boy crying wolf, maybe at some point, somebody will be right, but you're going to lose so much money trying to take a point of view around this topic that it's more practical to just look at dollar flows. And dollar flows go up in moments of stress, not go down. And they go up in a distributed manner across the monetary plumbing of the world. That's the latter. I mean, I think that there was a rumor going around. I don't know how true it is that FTX was days away from getting a critical approval by the SEC to actually even further legitimize their US exchange before they went out of business. So I think Gensler had to pivot very hard from at a minimum being very pro FTX. And there's all kinds of stories about his interrelatedness with Sam and his family. To very anti bit or anti crypto in general, that's mm. clearly happened. But look, I think that this is like a lot of tin hatting, which I don't think is very productive. If mm -hmm. you look at the total number of non zero Bitcoin wallet addresses in the world, and let's be extremely generous and say it's 100 million, there's still 7 billion people in the world. And so I just think everybody that tries to speak about the fragility of the US and worldwide banking system is right. But and that part I think is quite lucid and unemotional. But every time they try to connect it to Bitcoin, they sound like a crazy person because they're yeah. just talking their book. And that is exactly the case, by the way, with this kid, Nick Carter. Yeah. And the best example to demonstrate this is in all of this chaos. If Bitcoin or crypto assets in general were truly a legitimate off ramp and salvation from US dollar hegemony and all of this stuff, why isn't Bitcoin at least at 35,000 a coin right now? It's barely above 28,000. It really hasn't moved that much. And I think the real answer is that most people in Bitcoin are not trying to hedge their existing fiat currency exposure they're just picking off people in retail <laughs> and they're just yeah. day trading this thing i well, mean the, how I else think do you that's... explain how else do you explain an asset that has not absolutely ripped in the face of all of this terrible news about the financial system and i think the answer is because it's still a cul-de-sac of users it's not broadly available not broadly adoptable not broadly used I, I still believe that it's valuable. I was the earliest proponent of Bitcoin, 2011, yeah. 2012. So I believe that there's a place for it in, in one's portfolio, but I just think connecting these dots 
misses the point. And I think the point is much, much bigger than a crypto off ramp. The point is that we have a lot of systemic shocks that are building up in the system. We have broken a ton of the systems that cause the financial infrastructure and the world to work properly. And we are just starting to uncover how they're broken. So I think we need to focus our energy on that and dial down a little bit of the Bitcoin maxi stuff because it distracts from a really important set of topics that are more inclusive and actually touch 7 billion people. My point is put this in the who cares bucket and get back to the facts. Friedberg mentioned it. We have a debt ceiling problem that's in the offing. Sachs mentioned it. We have a commercial real estate crisis. We just talked about the fact that he didn't raise rates enough, nor did he cut enough. So we're in this weird middle path that, that Jay Powell we're talking about. So those are the facts on the ground that I think we should focus on because those will have implications to how people can borrow, start businesses, capitalize risk assets. That's a big problem.